Would you like to know the secrets to become a thought leader in your industry? If the answer is yes, then today's episode is definitely for you. Because my guest today is Jim Rickards. Jim is a lawyer and investment banker turned economist, thought leader, and author. He has over 35 years of experience working in capital markets on Wall Street and was a former advisor to the Pentagon, the CIA, and the White House. Jim has written seven books, and all of them topped the New York Times bestseller list. And on this episode, you'll discover the secrets Jim uses every day to be so prolific, to write best-selling books, to write a monthly flagship newsletter in the financial space, and to spark fresh ideas and insights. We'll also talk about Jim's latest book called Sold Out, which tackles the disruption of the global supply chain and how it will affect the digital economy. And finally, you're also going to discover Jim's take on on artificial intelligence. Welcome to Build Your Thing, the podcast where we help content creators find their unique creative voice, build their tribe of loyal fans, and monetize their work. I'm your host, Matt Giaro, and I have been a Jim Ricketts fanboy for several years. So I couldn't be more excited to bring you Jim on the show. And with that being said, let's get started. All right, Jim, welcome. Thank you. Great to be with you, Matt. It's a pleasure. Jim, one of the things that I've been impressed by, and I think a lot of people are too, is when it comes to your prolific output. So you've been able to crank out bestseller after bestseller. You have a monthly newsletter with fresh insights about the global economy and what's happening in the market. So what is, is Jim Rickards a bot? Or, or, so what is actually your, your, your secret sauce to create so much relevant content? Uh, it's a great question. I, I guess uh, there are probably a number of answers to it, but the number one answer is I really love what I do. And so it's work. I mean, writing is hard work. And uh, you mentioned my uh, flagship newsletter, Strategic Intelligence. Uh, thank you. That's our that's our largest work. We do uh, – oh, I have a couple of co-contributors, but just myself, I do 5,000 words a month. Uh, but the total publications may be more like eight or 9,000 words a month times 12 months. So we got 100,000 words is a, is a long book, and we put that out. But we also have uh, four or five specialized newsletters that are targeted you know, to particular, well, to subscribers, but they target particular areas of the market. And we give those are the ones where we actually give uh, recommendations. Um, but it's all, you know, it's all good content. We take it seriously. We work hard. And of course, I've written uh, at this point eight books now at, at this point. So it takes a lot of time and it is hard work, but I love writing. Um, and uh, I started doing this uh, in this form about uh, 12 years ago. My my first book, Currency Wars, came out in 2011. Um, and so I've been working hard on that ever since. I started the newsletter um, writing around 2014, a couple of years after that. But um, I've kind of been a writer my, my whole life. Most of my career, I was a, a lawyer. Uh, always worked in house. Uh, glad to say, I never worked in a law firm. Uh, although I had the privilege of working with a lot of great law firm lawyers, but um, for investment banks and hedge funds and uh, um, stock exchanges and other, you know, financial institutions, uh, financial entities of different kinds. And as a lawyer, all you do is, I mean, you write. There's a lot of you know, negotiation, but you're writing contracts, memos, etc. Now, there's a big difference between a a contract and a, a legal memo on the one hand and a book on the other. But the the art of writing is something I've done for decades. And so, and particularly as a lawyer, you're very precise with words and you, you want to you know be clear, et cetera. Um, and so I was able to, and by the way, there's kind of a long history of, of lawyers who became very successful writers. Uh, um, you know, Scott Turow, he, of course, he's a novelist, uh, but, but a lot of, uh, a lot of lawyers have made that transition. So when I started writing books and newsletters, um, it was not difficult in the sense that, um, I was kind of used to being at a, well, I started, I started on typewriters, but you know, key, keyboards, uh, computers and other systems. So that was a, that was a pretty good segue. But the the content, of course, is much broader. It's um, macroeconomics, principally, and a lot of specific applications of that. But um, but I love doing it. So I spend hours, of course, you know, each day. And then um, when you when you uh, have a book, when you're working on a book project, and then you've got your I call it my day job, you know, my newsletters and so forth. And then you squeeze in the writing of the book, you know, whatever on weekends or evenings or whatever. It's, it's a lot of work, but, but I love doing this. So my, my advice would be, um, as a, you know, if one is, uh, creating content, whether it's podcasts, webcasts, 
books, newsletters, um, management consulting type things, uh, uh, whatever your medium, whatever your channel is, you'll do your best if it's something that you're genuinely enthusiastic about. You like exploring. You like helping others. Um, that that makes the uh, the work. Uh, you know, if you're doing something you don't like, maybe you're talented at it. Maybe you know something about it, but you don't really. Your heart's not really in it, or you don't really believe in it, which is worse. Or uh, uh, it's not something you're particularly interested in. Then it's just more like drudgery. Uh, but so I would say the key to being this prolific is enjoying what you do. Wow. I love it. So I know, Jim, that you are sitting on a wealth of information. So you're reading a lot, doing a lot of research. You had a, a very like prolific career, like working on Wall Street. You have been advisor to the CIA, the Pentagon, the White House, just to mention a few. So you've amassed a ton of experience, a ton of insights, So how do you make sense all of this? So do you have kind of a system that you use to manage information? Um, how do you approach, you know, coming up with ideas, doing the research, connecting the dots and everything that you need to just write relevant content? Well, as a, as a lawyer and I, you know, I graduated from law school in 1977, but I actually started as a, an intern, uh, a legal intern um, in my second year of law school in 1976. So um, I had a kind of 45 year career as a lawyer. A lot, the three longest uh, postings I had, I was international tax counsel at Citibank. Uh, and that was wonderful. It was, that was from oh, 76 to 85, but um, it, uh, I had always been uh, interested in the international Um, realm. I always wanted to to do work in, in international transactions, international finance. That started when I was like a, like a nine-year-old kid. My parents signed me up for <laughs> when I was nine. It was long before computers or anything of the kind. But um, I get this book series and they would send you uh, a, a book every month. And it was a, a paperback book about a country. It could be Pakistan or India or you know Chile or Argentina or wherever. Uh, and then in the middle of the book, there were a couple pages of adhesive stamps and w with perforations. And you would pull the stamps out and then separate them and then kind of lick them and post them into the book. So you're kind of illustrating your own book. But uh, but I was taken with these pictures. I, I would say, ah, oh, there's the Taj Mahal. I want to go there. Or there's, uh, you know, the Himalaya. I want to go there, et cetera. And, or, but it could be, it wasn't always, you know, mountain. This could be you know, islands or the Bahamas, whatever it was, I wanted to go to all those places. And I learned a lot about them through these books. So that, that never went away. So when I was in law school and you were trying to figure out a specialty, I chose international taxation. And then I joined Citibank rather than a law firm because at the time, Citibank had offices or affiliates in more countries than the State Department had embassies. I think the U.S. was in 95 countries around the world and Citibank was in about 103. So I said, well, I'll go. That's a bigger platform than the State Department, so I'll go there. Uh, and and I, I traveled extensively. Um, my, I was sort of, you know, you started as the junior, even though I was a lawyer, I, I was I reported to more senior people. And uh, when I got the Asia Pacific Australia region, my boss would go to, um, uh, well, so Asia Pacific Africa, uh, Africa region. Uh, my boss would go to, you know, Tokyo, Sydney and Hong Kong, and I would go to Kinshasa, Nairobi, and uh, uh, Zimbabwe. So, um, but it was great experience. I would, I was kind of on the edge. And this is 40 years ago. So, um, I mean, Africa is still developing economies, but it was even more, um, it wasn't that far removed, candidly, from the post colonial uh, years when you went to, you know, Cote d'Ivoire or, uh, Uh, places like Senegal in the early 80s. I mean, the French <laughs> French uh, military and the French uh, bureaucrats were still around. So uh, um, it, it was a very interesting transitional stage. So I, I got immersed in that and learned quite a bit about it and then just kind of carried that forward in all the transactions um, I've done since. So that was, that was a good background. It was also what led to me being tapped uh, by the CIA after 9-11 because uh, one of the things I did – Uh, at Citibank was um, they had a huge operation in Pakistan after the Iranian revolution in 1979. Zia al-Huq, who was the dictator of Pakistan at the time, you know, Iran declared itself the Islamic Republic. Uh, and Zia al-Huq said, wait a second, I'm the Islamic Republic. Pakistan was the original Islamic Republic. So he felt he had to outdo the Ayatollahs. And he decreed that all banking institutions had to convert to uh, 
um, Islamic law to Sharia, Sharia compliant banking. Uh, so here's Citibank with this multi-billion dollar operation. We had offices in Karachi and Lahore and Lahore and a few other places. So I was sent out to handle this conversion. Um, as a result of which, I became expert in Islamic banking at a time when very few people, even in the Islamic world, knew that much about it, but certainly not in, in Western finance. Um, and that was that. So I did that and took a few years. Well, anyway, sort of flash forward 30 years after 9-11, I'm at a cocktail party in, uh, on a mountaintop estate in, in uh, St. Croix in the Virgin Islands. And um, I, you know, you make small talk, whatever. And I was talking to his very senior asset manager, one of the biggest in the world. I said, oh, yeah, I did this, I did that. And, you know, and I, I did the, uh, this project in Pakistan where we had to convert to Islamic banking. So he kind of stopped the conversation, took me aside and said, hey, um, I've been um, I'm working with the CIA and in terms of counterterrorist finance. If you're expert in that, would you mind getting a call from them and, you know, seeing what you do? I said, of course, you know, at that time, uh, well, it's still true today, you, you would do whatever you could to help the country. So I I got the call and I went down to Langley and I was sort of just a panelist in a one day session, but they invited people to contribute to a secure website. And I took it upon myself to write a fairly long report. Well, that was very well received. They said, Hey, this is, this is what we're looking for. One thing led to another. And I ended up being um, co-director of something called project prophecy. But, uh, and that's where I learned a lot about, analytical techniques and I'm being long winded, but that was really your, your question. What, what techniques do you use? So I had the legal skills, I had the writing skills, I had international skills and, and a lot else besides, but, um, in analysis, uh, if you go back, you know, 40 years or 50 years, and that was before I was working for the intelligence community, the, the scarce resource was information, you know, like a spy getting access to doc documents and little, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, Minox camera and taking pictures and you know, all the things you see in the movies. Uh, and there's still a bit of that going on, although it's mostly electronic these days. But um, but the uh, but it was really really hard to get information. By the 2000s, um, the information was plentiful. It was a wave of information. Open source intelligence is as powerful as uh, you know what the spies bring back. Um, but this the scarce resource was the analytical ability. Could you take all this information and turn it into something that, again, as you described, filling in a mosaic or connecting the dots, um, and and that's really difficult. But one of the uh, one of the points I make is that um, you know in the aggregate there's a lot of information, but on the particular matter you're analyzing, there might not be that much. And if you had all the information you needed, I, I would say I always say a smart high school kid could solve the problem. But intelligence analysts are tasked with solving problems when they don't have all the information. They've got tidbits, but uh, and a lot of these things are life or life and death. You can't wait until you get all the information you want because another 9-11 could happen in the meantime. So we use a technique called uh, Bayes' theorem. There are a number of techniques, but one of them is Bayes' theorem. And Bayes' theorem is an equation that you use when you don't have all the information you want. And you start out with an assumption, a priori assumption, and if you had no information at all, just you, you know, you have a binary outcome, kind of good or bad, black and white, whatever, and you had no information, you you start with 50-50. You say, well, I don't really know anything. So I'm going to say 50% probability of one outcome, 50% probability of the other. But then as you go along, new information comes in, and you plug it into the equation, and you, uh, you recompute, and the odds change. And they can work. If you have a hypothesis, they can support your hypothesis, in which case you keep going. Uh, and until you get up to maybe an 80 or 90% certainty, and then you can start to make some uh, decisions. Or it refutes your hypothesis. It says, no, you're on the wrong track. Then you have to tear it up, you know, throw out your hypothesis and come back with another one. That's hard to do. You know, People get married to their hypotheses, and uh, there's something called confirmation bias where everything that comes in that agrees with you, you say, well, that must be good. And if it disagrees with you, you say, well, that must be garbage, and you throw it out. Um, but um, if you can overcome that, and the first step in overcoming it is to know it exists, we all have it, but you can fight it um, and treat the information in a neutral way as either you know confirming or, or refuting the thesis, you can get very good results. Now, statisticians hate what I just described because they just want more data. Give me data, 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 and I can do the regressions and the correlations and make some predictions, which is not necessarily true because the past is not always, or sorry, the future does not always resemble the past. There are big differences. 
But if you're willing to be patient and and start out with, you know, insufficient information that you know, and then but do the updating. The updating is the key. Then it is a very powerful tool. So I use that now in my financial forecasting, capital markets forecasting newsletters, et cetera. So um, Bayes theorem is a powerful tool. Um, I also use behavioral psychology, history. History is something that's thrown out the window by a lot of people, but it's a very powerful tool. And then uh, complexity theory, which has been around in physics and other disciplines for uh, a long time, but uh, 80 years at this point. But I, I was one of the first to import complexity theory into capital markets, which are quintessential um, complex dynamic systems, and we get very good results from that. Yeah, like um, I love that because um, I also heard you mention on the interview, it was, I guess, for one of your books that you also imported, I guess, it was something related to virology, right? And then you applied it to the financial markets. Don't, don't quote me exactly on that, but I, I know that like you are pretty good in importing things from one discipline to another. Well, that's, that's a pretty good description. Uh, uh, and uh, that's, that's exactly uh, what I did. And others have, have done it as well, but it's another overlooked tool. So, you know, when, you, when you're talking about finance, you'll hear a couple of phrases over and over, uh, you know, contagion. You know, Lehman Brothers collapses and all of a sudden there's contagion, contagion and Morgan Stanley's in trouble and AIG's failing, et cetera. Um, well, contagion is used kind of metaphorically in the financial wor world, but it turns out that the mathematics are identical to contagion in the world of, of virology and uh, epidemiology. I mean, epidemiology is an interesting science. I spent a lot of time um, kind of coming up the curve there because I, in my book, The New Great Depression, which came out in January 2020, it was about the economic impact of COVID, COVID pandemic. But you couldn't write about the economic impact without writing about the pandemic itself. I mean, that's nonsense. So uh, I had a couple of chapters, and I, I, I knew I knew when I wrote the book, I said, all right, I'm going to you know, have a lot to say about epidemiology and virology. I'm not a doctor, obviously. Well, I'm not a medical doctor anyway. So I better get this right because if I don't, I'm going to be picked apart by experts and discredited, et cetera. I said, I really better get this right. And I read literally hundreds of peer-reviewed um, papers. And, uh, you know, honestly, if you're, you know, assuming you're bright and diligent and hardworking, there's, those papers are accessible. You don't have to be a virologist to read a paper in virology and to understand it. It's, you know, if it's well done, it's, it's actually pretty accessible. So um, I did a lot of that, but but one of the uh, the key models in epidemiology is called the SCIR model, SCIR. So that stands for uh, susceptible, meaning you could get the disease. Um, e is uh, exposed. Have you been exposed to the virus? I is infected. Did you get infected? And R is recovered. That is, you got it and you survived and you're still alive. Uh, of course, the uh, the residual of that is you're dead. So um, you know you got it and you died, but that's just a, a math uh, a math issue. So that's the SCIR model, um, and it uh, it is extremely powerful for predicting the course of diseases. Now you have to fill in some variables. You have to say, okay, what's the susceptible group? Is it the whole world, which kind of was the case with COVID? Uh, you know, SARS CoV two. Or, you know, is it, is it localized? Have you been able to quarantine to some extent? Um, is, it, is it easy to get exposed or not? Well, SARS-CoV-2 or COVID, in other words, is, is the disease. SARS-CoV-2 is the virus. Uh, yes, yeah, an airborne respiratory virus. It, you know, um, it, it gets around. It goes where it wants, as I described. All, all this nonsense about, you know, Matt, look, we know, we now know. But I said this in 2020. But there's a lot more evidence today, although I had a lot of evidence that the masks don't work. The lockdowns didn't work. The vaccines didn't work. I was actually on a, a rate live radio interview with a, someone in Seattle, but you know, Seattle, all those people out there have kind of lost their minds. Um, and I was talking about my new book sold out, but I was described how COVID impacted the supply chain. The, the book sold out is about the supply chain. So I was describing the impact of COVID and I just sort of casually said, you know, of course, uh, lockdowns don't work. They destroyed the economy, but, uh, but they don't work in the vaccines don't work, uh, and they don't, that's clear. Well, the um, the anchor, the host was appalled. She said, what do you mean? 
what's your source on that? I said, Johns Hopkins University website, just have a look. I said, 5 million people who were vaccinated and double boosted got COVID in December, 2021. Uh, that was during the, um, uh, the Omicron phase. So I said, if 5 million people were uh, vaccinated and double boosted and they got it, don't tell me it works. It obviously doesn't. Uh, well, she was, she just got flushed. She goes, that's misinformation. She actually yelled at her director, cut the microphone, get this guy off the air. And I said, um, she goes, that's misinformation. I said, well, this is censorship. Um, she goes, well, it's my show. And I said, it sure is. I, you know, do, do your thing. So I was actually thrown off live air because somebody from Seattle could, didn't read the literature. But, um, uh, but this model as is, is goes way beyond. It's been around much longer than um, COVID. It, it applies to COVID, but it applies to every um, every uh, you know, pandemic uh, or, or even epidemics. But you can take that and bring it into finance. So susceptible, you know, are you a, a basically you know financial institution? Uh, do you borrow from others? Are you leveraged? Well, that makes you susceptible to a run on the bank. Are you exposed? Well, some bank runs are local. Some go global. Uh, infected, meaning are you, in fact, experienced a situation where your short-term liabilities are not being rolled over, your lines of credit are being pulled, your repos are not being renewed, et cetera, and recovered. Okay, you got through it, but, uh, you know, J.P. Morgan got through the uh, 2008 meltdown, but some people didn't, you know, and among the dead are uh, Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, and, uh, you know, to, to some extent, uh, AIG, although I guess AIG was put on life support. So, and but the point is the model fits perfectly. The math is the same. The inputs are different, of course. Names are different. Uh, and I've had a lot of success with that. Um, so for me, contagion in finance is not a metaphor. It's a, it's a very apt description of how uh, panic spread. And uh, another economist uh, who, who uh, explained this in, in, in a very powerful way um, is uh, um, Robert Schilling of Yale, who uh, wrote a book called Narrative Economics, but he used this model explicitly and, and put the equations I'd been using for a long time, as had others, but he uh, uh, he really put it out there in a way that was very comprehensible. I really recommend that book. So yeah, uh, I've taken, I'm, I'm not embarrassed about borrowing from other science if it applies, so bringing in complexity theory, bringing in epidemiological models into capital markets, they, they work quite well. They actually work a lot better than the models that um, the Fed and uh, and Wall Street use. So that's why I've been able to develop a very good track record in terms of um, um, forecasting. I'm not smarter than all the people at the Fed, but I have better models because, I mean, they're out there. You just have to uh, slough off your uh, you know, neo-Keynesian education. I like that because you mentioned that you have the right models. So how can someone just start developing this model? So um, you mentioned earlier that you know, behavior, um, uh, behavior psychology, um, also history can help. What would you, what would you suggest to someone who's just, you know, trying to download the right models into his brain? I think the best approach is to, um, to read and just talk to people and study as much as you can, learn as much as you can and be very open-minded. Because what happens is I, I consider a PhD in economics to be, a, a handicap to understanding economics. Um, and the reason is they've got a long list of models. They've got, um, uh, you know, the Phillips curve. Uh, they've got, um, you know, dynamic stochastic uh, models. They've got, um, uh, trying to think of some, some of the others, uh, you know, you know, Keynesian multipliers, um, you know, while ignoring debt GDP ratios, um, you know, QE, you know, Ben Bernanke wins the Nobel Prize for QE. It doesn't work. There's no evidence that it works, you know, et cetera. And so they teach you all this and people work hard to understand it. You know, some of the calculus is not, part is not that hard. Regressions, I mean, the, the, some of the models are, some of the, the math is complex, but, you know, with spreadsheets and automation, all that math can just be done with it, you know, just by pushing uh, um pushing a button so um but but the problem is they learn it and they apply it and it just doesn't work and they never stop to question whether the model actually works and they absolutely never um consider other models so uh so i'm an economist um you know i, I 
uh, capital markets expert analysts that do an enormous amount of work in the field, but I'll sit down and read uh, you know, a very good text on physics or cosmology or uh, behavioral psychology um, and you know read a ton of history. And so I'm, an, I'm, an, I'm internalizing all of that learning, but at the same time, I'm an expert in capital markets, so I'm always asking myself, well, is this something that would work in capital markets? And every now and then, maybe more often than that, the answer is yes. So, you, but you have to start, you have to break the mold. You have to start with the assumption that capital markets are a complex dynamic system. Now, the whole field of complexity is a big field, but there are very good books on it. Uh, and the interesting thing about complexity, the science is very powerful. It explains some of the most uh, difficult problems that science faces, including climate change, uh, climatology, um, you know, astrophysics, uh, and, and a lot else, and a lot of th more down to earth things, uh, including the growth of cities. And, uh, I mean, there's a model that is extremely accurate. If you give, if the input is the population of the city, um, the model will tell you exactly how many gas stations they have. Uh, and it's not a linear function, uh, but, but the point is, um, it, it's it's just be, and, and no no you know dictator is saying here's how many gas stations we have and there's a lot of competition and gas stations open and close, but just um, through recursive functions, cities of a certain size will just have a certain number of gas stations. You, most people don't necessarily see the correlation, but it exists. But it's it's called an emergent property. In other words, people do it themselves without being told. It's just something that comes out of the complex dynamic and it, and you can't predict it. Um, I mean, when, once you have the data and you test it and you look back, then yes, it has a predictive analytic function. But um, if you didn't know anything else and you just said, uh, here's a city, how many gas stations are you going to have? You wouldn't necessarily have any way of knowing that. So the point is it takes, it takes emergent properties. Um, you study them in every scale, size of city. Uh, you do the degree distribution. You come up with the um, um, the function. Uh, you know, a, a superlinear, in many cases, sublinear. In this case would be a sublinear function. Um, and then then you have this enormously powerful predictive analytic tool. But uh, but then you can apply it to capital markets. The, the models started with things like how many gas stations in a city or how many skyscrapers in a city, et cetera. Uh, how much energy do they need, et cetera. You can, and again, it, it's useful for all that. But once you understand the model, you can import it to capital markets. So my advice would be, if I, I happen to be a capital markets analyst and, and forecaster, but you could be in any other field, I mean, certainly marketing, um, advertising, uh, communications, you know, many, many other fields, but read outside your field, read, if you're not a physicist, read physics. If you're not a, uh, um, uh, you know, applied mathematician, read something about, um, uh, scaling functions. Uh, if you're in anything more complicated than, uh, um, you know, maybe a small garden, uh, read about complexity theory and you'll discover that it has application to what you're doing. So that's that would be my advice, which is, you know, of course, have your expertise. And that goes back to the first thing I said, which is if you don't love what you're doing, you probably won't be very good at it. So people love all kinds of different things uh, from, you know, uh, uh, you know, knitting to uh, nuclear physics. But read and study outside your field from the best um, minds that you can. Don't get too hung up on equations if you don't understand them. Just keep reading, gloss over them, but try to absorb the text. And by the way, there are many, many comp complex fields where the thought leaders have written down-to-earth books. I mean, they, they, they write a popular treatment. Don't be shy about a popular treatment. We're all part of the populace, and so it can make uh, technical fields very accessible. But that will give you a toolkit to use in whatever your core expertise Fantastic, fantastic. I, I love that. So, Jim, let's talk about your latest book, uh, Sold Out, where you talk about the broken supply chain, surging inflation, and the catastrophic consequences to the global economy. Um, I want to take this a step further. Um, some people, some creators or people who are actually working online may say, well, I'm working online, I'm selling digital products or services, so the broken supply chain won't affect me that much. What's your answer to that? It's a great question. And when you understand what a supply chain is, uh, you'll 
very quickly see that uh, there's nothing that's not part of a supply chain. So let me let me explain what I mean by that. So let's say you go to the store and you buy a loaf of bread. And you say, well, where'd the bread come from? Well, there's a bakery across town and they bake it and they bring it over by truck and they put it on the shelf and I buy it. And there's the supply chain. Um, well, okay, but that loaf of bread has a wrapper. Is it paper or plastic? Uh, where'd the wrapper come from? Who made the paper wrapper? Who made the plastic wrapper? If that's the case, how is that put on? Oh, you say it was brought over by a truck? Who built the truck? Uh, who's the truck driver? How do you get truck drivers? Uh, the truck runs on diesel fuel. Okay, where does the diesel fuel come from? Where's the refinery? Where the, where's the distribution network? Where's the gas station, et cetera? Um, oh, you say the baker baked a loaf of bread. Well, that's nice. Where'd the oven come from? Who built the oven? Uh, what's in an oven? Uh, you know, you got tempered glass, uh, steel, uh, semiconductors galore. Um, somebody made the knobs, etc. cetera. Um, oh, let's look upstream to the oven manufacturer. Where do they get their inputs? Well, oh, well the tempered glass comes from Germany and the steel comes from Canada and the semiconductors come from Taiwan, etc. And then back to the baker. Uh, well, how do you bake a loaf of bread? Well, you start with flour, you know, water, uh, yeast, etc. Well, where did all that come from? Well, the flour came from a mill. Okay, where'd the mill get the flour? Well, it came from a farm. Oh, Gee, where the farm? How the farm grow the wheat? Oh, you got tractors and you know, GPS systems and irrigation systems and uh, seeds and so forth. Oh, where the tractors come from? So I, you, you take my point, which is that this is what's called the extended supply chain. When you take every take the finished product, but figure out all the inputs to the finished product and the transportation lanes, and then what equipment you need to run the transportation lanes, etc. And then if you think of it as a horizontal line from now from a seed supplier through you know a transportation lane a farmer a mill um a bakery onto the grocer shelf and then have a section uh, an, an array of vertical intersections where each one of those points in that horizontal supply chain has its own vertical suppliers uh, of itself and then they have their own set on and on and on you pretty quickly realize and i said this in the book that the supply chain is not part of the economy the supply chain is the economy. And I would challenge any skeptic or anyone who thinks that supply chains are either trivial or um, you know, easy to fix, et cetera, uh, to identify. And that, by the way, everything I just said applies not only goods to services. Uh, you know, if, if you're a lawyer, but let's say, uh, all right, well, you're in an office, you've got assistants, you've got word processors, you've got legal libraries, you've got training, you, et cetera, et cetera. You've got the court system. So it has its own service supply chain. So I challenge anyone to name any good or service, anyone that isn't part of a supply chain. And once you get that far and you realize that this, the supply chain is the, the economy, or put differently, there's nothing in the economy that's not part of a supply chain, and do all the vertical and horizontal you know, intersections that I described, which go on and on and on, the complexity of it uh, outstrips the entire computational power of the world. In other words, you can model it theoretically the way I just described, and you can model a subset, a, a, a limited supply chain, but there's no way you can model the whole thing. Again, there's not enough computational power in the world. I haven't even talked about energy inputs and what's behind those and, and so on and so forth. So so when you get that far, you, you just think of supply chains as um, – you know, quintessential complex dynamic systems. And now, once again, I talked earlier about bringing, this, bringing complexity theory into capital markets. Okay, well, now we're bringing complexity theory into supply chains, which are quintessential uh, complex dynamic systems. But you can start to look at and use the characteristics of complex systems generally to understand the difficulties in supply chains and why they break down. And a lot of it's a function of scale. Uh, you can't um, you can't take a complex system and just scale it up to infinity or even beyond a certain point. It will break down on its own. Uh, and we said, "Oh, this thing broke down, or that thing broke down." You know, the Port of Los Angeles was backed up. We had a Trans Pacific traffic jam on um, container cargo vessels, which we did. I mean, there were there were vessels sitting in uh, Yokohama and uh, Ningbo, which is the main port near Shanghai. That where the um, the charterer or the shipper said, "Don't send it because when you get to Los Angeles, there's no place to go. We can't unload it in Los Angeles because they're backed up. You know, the the vessels are backed up all the way to Baja, 
So keep it in Ningbo, no, po no point sending it across the Pacific Ocean. So you literally had a trans-Pacific traffic jam and container cargo vessels. Um, but that uh, that's an example of this contagion that we talked about earlier that, um, well, why, why was the Port of Los Angeles backed up in the first place? Well, it turns out you can only stack containers six high. And beyond that, it's, it becomes too dangerous or unstable. And they had like large kind of parking lot facilities and they were stacking up the containers. They got to the point where there was no, no place else to stack them. You couldn't unload the vessels because there was no place to put the containers. Well, why were the containers stacked up so high that you couldn't unload anymore? Not enough trucks. Oh, well, can we get more trucks? Well, you know, the, and there's, there's a shortage of drivers. There, the uh, American Trucking Association estimates there, there's a, a shortage of 80,000 truck drivers in the United States, probably, you know, worse worldwide. So again, you, you take the point, which is that um, you can't just, you know, name the Port of Los Angeles as the bad guy. They were working 24 hours a day. Kind of hard to blame truckers. They're, they're putting in extra hours. Um, and, you know, the shippers, Nobody wants the shippers to no one. No one wants the vessel to uh, cross the Pacific more than the shippers and the people who own the goods in the containers because they're paying demurrage and, and inventory costs and so forth. But the point being, complex systems always break down that way. It's just a matter of time. And looking at a single link doesn't really answer the question because it, it, it's multiple links and they cascade. That's the, the technical term. They cascade into a much bigger breakdown. So I talk about all this in the book, but then I, so kind of where are we now? Um, and, you know, in, in Sold Out, I describe uh, what I call supply chain 1.0, which lasted from 1989 to 2019, uh, you know, 30 years. Why 1989? Well, that was the year the Berlin Wall fell, um, the, the Soviet Union was formally dissolved in 1991, uh, but it was also around the same time that um, vastly expanded computing power, larger databases, uh, better programming, um, uh, you know, various forms of applied mathematics, artificial intelligence, et cetera, came into play right around the same time that globalization was, uh, was uh, opening up and the 90s were really the age of globalization. Uh, it's still with us, but that's when that exploded because you, you can't really compare it to the period from Bretton Woods to, uh, to 1989 because Russia was out of the game and China was out of the game. It wasn't until, you know, Deng Xiaoping and, and his opening and that, that grew throughout, you know, that really started, I mean, technically started in 1979, but it didn't get very far. And then it was set back by Tiananmen Square in 1989. It wasn't until the nineties, uh, 1994 in particular, when they did a maxi devaluation of the Chinese yuan and, and Deng Xiaoping did his southern tour, I believe that was 1992. That's when the China market really opened up. And the same thing with the, with Russia, you know, you had to, um, you know, first get out of the Soviet Union, the breakup of the Soviet Union, et cetera. And then the nineties were pretty, you know, pretty wild decade. I mean, there were machine gun fights in the streets of Moscow, but it was like Chicago in the twenties, but, um, there was a lot of direct foreign investment that came in. So that was real globalization and it grew and grew and grew. But, um, so, but what was the goal of, uh, supply chain science in the context of globalization? It was, Cheaper, cheaper, cheaper. Make everything more efficient. So, and Walmart is the quintessential example of this. And I put Amazon in the same category and uh, some other, a lot of other firms. Um, they said, okay, I've got seven shippers. Let's reduce that to three because I can give each one more volume and lower the price. Um, move my manufacturing to China because the labor costs are lower. Um, you know, stretch the supply chain from Shangxing to to uh, to New York because. Uh, Every step of the way, I'll have uh, cheaper inputs. Um, Walmart invented something called cross-stocking. Well, what's that? Well, it used to be a truck pulled up at a warehouse or distribution center. You unloaded everything, and then another truck would pull up, and you would pick the, the whatever the shipment was out of the warehouse and load it onto the second truck, and the second truck would pull away and make the delivery. And Walmart said, why don't we skip the warehouse? Like, just have the two trucks pull up about the same time, unload from one truck to you know perhaps one or more other trucks, on a loading dock and send them on their way, but never put it in the warehouse. In fact, what is a big box store? A big box store is the warehouse. One of the reasons they're so big is because they've got so much in them that they don't need warehouses. So, so the, the, and there are many other examples and they're all in the book. But the point is, by doing this, you were reducing costs. And it was 
a lower cost for consumers, higher margins for uh, manufacturers and retailers. So the cost savings were real, but there was a hidden cost. And the hidden cost was when you did everything I just described, you were making it less robust and less resilient. You were creating enormous um, frailties in the system that could, that when one of them broke down, the whole thing was going to start to collapse. And that's what happened. So we were taking the benefit of lower costs, which were real, uh, but we were ignoring the hidden costs, which were that the whole thing was so scaled up that it was extremely vulnerable to a breakdown, which eventually came home to roost. And that that started in in 2019 and got worse. A lot of people blame COVID, and I show in the book that the breakdown was started before COVID. Now, COVID made it worse, no doubt about it, and the war in Ukraine made it worse. There's no doubt about that. But the war in Ukraine and COVID were not the causes of the supply chain breakdown. It started really with the Trump tariffs uh, after 2018. That's why I kind of start the breakdown in 2019. There's very good data on that, and it's all in the book. So um, so where we are now, I, the metaphor I use is you, you take a vase, somebody knocks it over, and it breaks into 5,000 pieces. You don't sit there on the floor and put the pieces back together. You sweep it up, throw it away, and go out and buy a new vase. And that's what's happening with the supply chain. We're going to get a new supply chain. I call it supply chain 2.0. And I describe what it is. Uh, and there's, again, a lot of a lot of work has been done on this, including by the Five Eyes, which is an intelligence sharing consortium among uh, US, Australia, New Zealand, UK, and Canada. Um, but the five, uh, five eyes are kind of branched out into uh, a lot of other fields, including what we're talking about, which is supply chain management. Um, so we'll get to something I call the College of Nations, where like-minded countries with um, shared values, and it's not just the Anglosphere. I mean, certainly I would include India, um, uh, Japan, and many other countries in Brazil, and many other countries in this group. They will trade with each other, and they will still outsource to each other, but it'll be a club, and you'll have to be in the club to get the benefits of this. China will not be in the club because of its human rights violations and, and uh, genocide and, um, and a lot else. So um, we're right now, we're muddling through. We're in an in-between phase. We, supply chain 1.0 has crashed. Supply chain 2.0 is coming, but not here yet. And we're in this in-between phase where we're dealing with a lot of efficiency, inefficiencies, rather, but not quite benefit, getting the benefit of the efficiencies. But the bottom line on the new supply chain one, sorry, two point oh, supply chain two point oh, it will be more expensive um, for a while, but it'll find its own efficiencies. But those costs will be well worth it because it will be more resilient and less prone. To what about the disruptions to the supply chain itself with? AI, machine learning, robotics. How do you see this may impact knowledge workers, people who deal with ideas, people who create content? Well, as a knowledge worker, I guess I should focus on that. Um, but <laughs> artificial intelligence is, you know, uh, is real. It's been around for a while. It's disappointed a lot of people. It's never quite lived up to all of its expectations. But it seems to be entering a new stage itself where um, the um, the, the, the quality and the iterative machine, what's called machine learning, uh, because are, are getting much better because processing power is much greater and people have devoted more resources to it. And robotics, uh, I think it kind of speaks for itself. Uh, we, you know, we've, we've gone from, you know, an arm that picks up a part and puts it in place and does that repetitively to things that are, uh, scary, scarily anthropomorphic, uh, and uh, you know, including leaping, uh, uh, leaping pets, and 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 the rest, but um, with with a lot of applications that are a lot more serious. So it's all real, um, and it's it's going to keep getting better. Um, I'm involved with a major artificial intelligence kind of center of excellence effort at, uh, based at the University of Florida in Gainesville. I'll be going down there in a few weeks to um, to meet with colleagues about that that, and they're getting quite a bit of money from Governor DeSantis. So that's extremely helpful. Having said that, um, I, AI uh, has its place. I'm very skeptical that it will deliver what people expect. And I'm equally skeptical that um, when people see it and are impressed by it, that they, well, I don't know if skeptical is the right word, but uh, concerned that people will take it at face value and not understand the development and the coding behind it. 
Uh, and I guess everyone's spun up and out. What's this thing, chat GPT or something uh, that, that everyone's talking about? Um, it's like, oh, I can ask you a question and it gives me an answer. Or I'll, I can dump in a spreadsheet and it'll give me a seven page, you know, analytical report that's as good as anything from Morgan Stanley, uh, you know, et cetera. Um, kind of true. I mean, you, I, I've seen that done where people just dump in a spreadsheet and out comes a, an analytical report. Uh, but it ignores the fact that artificial intelligence is not intelligent. It's, um, it's processing. It's, Iterative, which means it can kind of get better on its own. It can learn, if that's the right word, from uh, uh, feedback. But it's still captive to the coding behind it. And if that embeds certain biases, which it does, are we setting ourselves up for a world where we're relying on AI as a friendly tool like a saw or a hammer, but we don't quite understand what might be malign or heavily biased, or political, or totalitarian, totalitarian input behind it, uh, and it kind of become captives to uh, a narrative. In other words, you know, hey, cliches, but it's a good one. You know, we, we've, we're creating a Frankenstein, but at least Frankenstein was—you could see it was a monster. Uh, but this one, I think, is much harder to see. Thank you very much, Jim. Appreciate it. Thanks. All right, so hope that you've enjoyed this episode. And as always, you're going to find all the links we mentioned in the show notes. And if you're a content creator or want to become one and want to monetize your knowledge online, then be also sure to check out my free emails because in my daily emails, you're going to learn how you can speed up your content creation workflow to create more content faster and thus attract more clients online in less time. It's the first link in the description. Thank you very much for tuning in today and I see you next week.